can get in! Yes! Yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for joining us for this latest episode of It's Not Cage Fighting and our UFC 228 preview show. My name is Carl Bainbridge and I'm joined as ever by Mr. Tim Close. Hello, you alright? And our special guest for today, the head coach of IMPIS MMA, Chris Burkle. Chris, Hello. thank you very much for joining us. Pleased to meet you. It was very much on short notice. We just found out on Thursday that Max is actually in Cyprus. Well, call it the yeah. Yeah. He picks his time and... yeah. Why would you want to choose Cyprus over Britain? I mean, look at this beautiful weather <laughs> here. Uh, I know. Strange, isn't he? Isn't he? Strange one. Yeah. But he will be back though on Thursday, which means he will be tuning in for the uh, sun Saturday's card, I should say. Um, and it's a big one, especially if you are a British MMA fan. Darren Till going for the Baltimore title. Definitely, yeah. I mean, he's, it, it's, it's mad. Like, he's only the third. I think British need to fight for the title. Obviously, Hardy, then Bisping. Um, but I suppose you've got McGregor if you're talking about all of Britain, like England. I don't know how you're going to go for it. But there. Uh, I think he's a quiet one, Darren Till, because obviously really he was unheard of not so long ago. And I don't think he's has he ever actually fought in, outside the UFC, outside the UFC. Did he? He never fought in England or anything, did he? Uh, did no, he? The, the Liverpool fight was his first fight uh, in England. This is going to be his first fight in America. Right. So a lot of his stuff beforehand was in Brazil. Right. And then he did the European circuit, so he was in Gdansk and he did like Rotterdam and places like that. So it's going to be a new experience for him. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting fight as well in regards to the welterweight division because. Obviously, there has been a lot of murmurings around Tyron Woodley, maybe not the most popular champion. And it's a division as well, which is really in transition. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be an interesting scrap because I mean, Tyron's been off for a year. Has he? Did he uh, uh, yes, off? last fight was uh, July 2017. Yeah, so I mean, in Chris's fights, Chris, uh, everyone's different. Like Some people get a bit ring rusty, but you're, in your seven pro fights, you've had like a year between yeah. some of them, haven't you? I mean, I had, I had a year between my fight with. Sean Romas in Lloyd Martin. Yeah. And did you feel any worse off the top but it? No. 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 No, so not, for that. not for that. Uh, I would like to use this opportunity as well to give a little bit of a call out to anybody who has been supporting the channel. We're up to about 8,800 subscribers, which, considering I just did this as a side project just to keep myself busy, has done far better than I ever thought it would do. I'd also like to give a call out as well to our Patreon channel. We have recently set one up. Obviously, it does take a lot of time and a lot of money to try and put these videos together. So, any sort, of, any sort of, if I can get the words out, any sort of support that you can give us would be thoroughly appreciated. We've got a link there in the uh, gra caption here, as you can see that just run down the bottom there. It is patreon.com forward slash it's not cage fighting. Any support that you can give to the channel would be greatly appreciated. With that being said, lads, it's time to talk about UFC 228 in general. I'm going to be starting first and foremost with. So sort of glossing over the uh, undercard as well, it's, mm -hmm. it's one which has a lot of interest as well from a British perspective because obviously we've got Darren Till obviously main event but we've also got Darren Stewart who yeah, is on the English, undercard as well. Yeah. And good to see Craig White as well getting a second opportunity with the US. Yeah, team. it's a big fight for uh, Craig, it's a big, big, big fight if I'm honest with uh, Diego Sanchez. I know, I think he's maybe last five, he's only won two, Ross has lost two, um, Diego, but he's... he's like mine and probably every other person is one of the all time favourite fighters, really. He really comes to fight and everything, so I think it's a it's probably a good fight for both parts. I'd like to say maybe Diego Sanchez is further up in the card, but I think he is coming down to that sort of where he's not in the main cards anymore. But it's also it's a major opportunity for Craig. And you know, if obviously Diego Sanchez still knows what he's doing, he's still keeping his hand in the game. So, and I think it's a winnable fight as well, cause um, for, yeah, for either I would say, for for either if I'm if I'm honest, I think I don't think it's a bad match really. Maybe however many years ago, but I think one's maybe on the up and one's maybe on the down. So the meeting in the middle, if you like. Another guy as well, which is sort of on the downturn as well, was another favourite fighter of mine, Jim Miller. He's uh, competing yeah. up against uh, Alex White, so we've got two Whites on the card, uh -huh. which I find quite ironic there. When you get to that sort of stage where Diego Sanchez and Jim Miller, where they're sort of maybe on the downturn of their career, when's the best time really to say that's enough? You don't know. There's no good time, no. is there? Because you know. want to end on a win. Yeah. You definitely want to end on a win, but... When you've won, you think, well, I've still got it. I've still, yeah, yeah. Dude, it's, it, it's quite a hard time to win a fight and think, right, I've had enough of you. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, this isn't just a hobby, they're making a living out of it. So, you know, you don't know what type of lifestyle they live. Mm -hmm. So, to keep up with that lifestyle, they might have to keep fighting. And while they're winning, why do you want to hang your gloves up? But they should do it before they go on that four or five losing streak. I think they need the right people around them to tell them. Yeah. I think yeah. Enough's, it's enough now. 
But if they remain injury free as well, I think you know as you get older. I mean, I'm only 26, but I'm still getting more and more injuries and bits and bobs. It just niggles. So I think after after them when they are on the the 30s and that, if they if they're injury free, fair enough. But if they get a lot of injuries and they have to pull out and and really they're doing some sort of pain, I think that's like you say, Chris said there. Yeah. I think you need good people around you that maybe who you respect and would listen to to give you the advice. And I think the other factor as well is if you maybe jump the gun and just retire a bit too early. You, I mean, we've seen so many fighters who people have written off and say they're done for, and then just come back and have these career resurgences. I mean, Andrei Arlovsky, people were saying he was done 10 years ago, and yeah. then he yeah. got something like 10 fights in a row. Like, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Unbe- unbelievable. I mean, I don't know the people all over. People, like I said, doing the same thing. And then, do you do what Chuck Liddell's done? Lost his last however many, 10 years ago. Mustn't be happy and mm-hmm. ended on a, losing, uh, on a losing streak. And now making a comeback ten years down the line. Is that skinned? <laughs> well, that's another He's thing. Skinned. I used to be doing all the rounds on the reality TV circuit. It was on like the American version of Big Brother. Right. Getting that desperate for money. I don't like the idea of that fight. What? Once again, that's the, the, he's been accustomed to a lifestyle, mm-hmm. and he, he probably doesn't want to let it go. Yeah. The only thing about that fight is, and I've said it from day one, it's a great fight for Tito, because at the end of the day, they had so much rivalry. He lost. He lost twice against him. But for Chuck, why would you fight that fight? I do not know. But obviously, by the legacy, you've just said exactly at the nail there, probably money. Got to be money. Strangely, though, after Logan Paul versus KSI, that isn't the biggest freak show fight in competitive sport. No, no, definitely not, no, no, definitely not, definitely not. Um, is, are there any fights on the undercard which sort of stand out for you when he sort of. It was probably more Diego Sanchez, if, we are, if I'm honest, just because also he's fighting a Brit, like, Welsh man, um, the Stuart. Um, like I said, the the, the, the undercard is they always take an undercards, but like I say, a lot of them are like up and coming or people that were ready to maybe one or two fights away from trying to get them their place on the main card really. I don't think it's a I don't think it's a a bad undercard, but I think as a from a British point point of view, a lot of British will be channeling in to watch the fight purposely for Darren Till. I think it would have been a good idea for Dana White to maybe even put more Brits on the undercard. Um, up and coming Brit fights to give them the chance to cross the pond and fight on a big card where they're going to be watched by the Brit- by the British public. You know what I mean? Would you agree with that, Chris? Aye, uh, yeah, definitely. Well, the only card fight I'm really looking forward to is the uh, actual FS1 headliner. It's uh, Carla Suarez versus Tatiana Suarez. And I mean, yeah, you've got Carla who's sort of experiencing a bit of a career turnaround. I think her striking is so much better. But it's all about Suarez. This is a girl who, ever since Tough Twenty Three. I've said could be a potential champion in the strawweight division. I mean, the fact that they were willing to sacrifice Alexa Grasso to her to basically build her up, mm-hmm. I think shows just how highly regarded she is by the UFC. Well, like I say, it must be. I mean, I don't know if she's drawn in as an audience for any reason, or it's just through a pure, pure talent of fighting that they throw their names about her there. But yeah, I mean, if she keeps on winning and keeps on going, then obviously she's going to... That's what they aim for, I think. I think now UFC put a load of more effort into women than they ever have. Yes. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, there's two on the main card. Two, two fights on the main card, and I believe Suarez versus Esparza was going to be on there. Right. And then they just rejigged the card around a little bit, so you could have easily had three. Three out of five. Yeah. That's a lot, isn't it? That's, 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 that's never been known. No, that's true. never been done before. No. So they are getting, they are getting. <laughs> we might get the day in a couple of years where we've got five females <laughs> fighting on the main card, five female fights. Well, I think 227 was the first time that they had, I think it was pretty much featherweights down apart from one fight. Right. And that was a division which didn't even exist um, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, you never know, maybe... They're changing have... things, aren't they? They are. They're changing things. In a... But they must be rolling with what the public want, because like you say, years ago, the main men were probably all the heavyweights. They put all heavyweight fights on for people, now we say, they're going for lighter weights and women. So, well, times have changed, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, one fight we will be starting with, though, is a welterweight encounter, and it's the first fight on the card. It is uh, Nico Price, the hybrid, and he's going up against, I hope I get this name right, Abdul Razak Alassane. It was a late addition to the main card, originally going to be one of the prelims, but I am very happy they have made th- this decision, because these are two guys with big knockout power. Yeah, everyone likes to see a knockout. I know we've seen there about changing, them, changing things from being heavyweights to now females and like the division but everyone for all you've got to like obviously Chris is yeah. brilliant on the floor and they're aggressive for all you've got to it's nice to um, what's the word I'm not for you like respect how good someone is on the floor everyone likes a brawl or a battle yeah, or a yeah, yeah. everyone everyone you can say what you want everyone understands 
a stand up yeah. is probably a good way to open the main card if the results go the right way and either one of them gets the knockout. And we'll start first and foremost with uh, Alassan. And it's the first time Alassan has faced a new opponent in over a year. He had two fights against Sava Omasi and he won both by first round KO. Uh, first fight was at UFC 218. Now, there was a bit of an early stoppage on that one. People weren't too happy about it, so they did the rematch at UFC 220. Another first round KO. So, this guy, as mentioned before, has a lot of power. All but one of these wins have come by knockout. Mm -hmm. um, what do you know about him? Do you think he's more of the knockout. future? Uh, I don't know yet. I, I'll be honest with you. I think. I, I'm not being awful, uh, but I think we, we'll have to see in the next couple of more fights probably. Uh, you know, I know he's got knockout power. He obviously has got definitely potential. The UFC will be looking at him now. They'll put him on the main card and they won't go now. Someone up there must be saying, look, uh, let's get him on the main card, chuck him in. If he wins this, he'll probably get another main card fight against a probably maybe more ranked opponent and everything else. Then that's when it'll come to it, when you've got a fight. And also, he might get sussed out in his game of things, you know. And also, how is he improving it each time, you know. Because sometimes, I know everyone wants to win, but probably getting first round TKOs all the time, is he, still, is he going to be improving? Mm -hmm. I think um, he's, a, he's a high level joker. He's, he's obviously got a high caliber of grappling. Um, he's striking, he's, yes, he's got massive KO power, but I don't think he's a very technical striker. No. And I think if he comes against somebody who. He could is, even get beat up this other stood up, yeah. Yeah, I think he'd get technically outclassed. So to me, I don't think he's he's not going to be top ten. I think he's going to be a fringe fighter, more than more than anything else. And I think Tim as well made a really good point there, which is yes, you might be getting all these first round knockouts, but if you get taken out of that comfort zone and you get pulled into these waters that you're not too familiar with, I mean we saw that with Francis Ngannou. Yeah. I mean he was knocking everybody out left, right, and centre. Got. The first sign of adversity against Stipe, and he's never been the same fighter since. No, that's it. Um, like we don't really know that much of his background in that sense, and like I say, he's calling him in and what the, what the, what he can do. You know, what I mean, at the end of the day, he can only go and win what he can do. He maybe can do things in deep water, and he can only do it. You know, he's doing well by going out and getting these early knockouts and take yours, but so you can't blame him for winning. You don't want to start faffing about and doing a three round fight yeah, if you yeah. don't have to. Um, but. Like I said, that, that's when time will tell when like Chris says, comes up against a more, a more superior opponent than maybe the ones he has been fighting. And quite appropriately, considering the short notice of this fight onto the main card, Nico Price is pretty much the king of the short notice fights. He always steps in as short notice replacement. And he's coming off arguably one of the best knockouts of the year against Randy Brown. Mm -hmm. Which was just amazing. He sort of like prepped him up. He was out on the ground, propped him up with his foot. And then just started hammering these hammer fists out, and there was this moment where the referee realised, oh god, he is actually out here, we need to get in here. Yes, I remember that I've one. I've seen that before in my life. <laughs> it was a brilliant, I know, I know that. Um, I, it's, it, it's, he's not going to be bothered by stepping in last minute. No. And that, one of the things as well I love about... Probably Alessandro will be more, more yeah. worried. He's been preparing for a different opponent. Yeah. So definitely. now he's got a different... Box of tricks. Yeah. And one of the things I do like about Nico Price as well is he's a little bit unconventional. People don't know what to expect from him. He has worked a lot more on his ground game compared to what he used to. Um, and I think as well he's a good student of the game. I think he I think he he does a lot of research into his opponents. He'll know exactly how Alassane's gonna fight. And yeah. between the two I would probably favour Nico for that reason. I think again though, if you get people into a brawl, which this is expected to be Anybody can knock anyone down, but I think Nico's going to do what he can to make sure it's fought on his terms. What's Nico? When did Nico take this fight? Uh, Nico, I think Nico took this fight, I think it was four weeks, five weeks notice. So that's not a good short notice to me. Is it your, like, if not, he's, been, he's probably been training and he's fight ready anyway. The always ready, yeah. aren't they? The, 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 like they say, so the, it's probably not no, um, a great deal. No, I don't think so either. And like I say, I think if he thought better of and in the UFC and that, no. I don't class it as a. Um, if it was me, I would have fight in five, six weeks. If we're, if I'm going to change an opponent now, it wouldn't throw me as much mm. as what it does in a couple of days. Yeah. Well, short notice fights as well have also had sort of an influence in regards to the main event because there's all these rumours that Kamara Usman might step in if Darren Till misses weight. We'll we'll get to those in a bit more detail when we talk yeah. about the main event. In terms of this card, though, do you think it's a good opener for the card? And who are your predictions to win it? 
for the, for the first for, uh, for the first main card, I think I think that's a I think that, that is a very good um, starter. Definitely, I do want you know. I mean, obviously, there's better players and different things, but for the audience, as a as a like I say, it, sometimes you get these two brawlers, you know, or two standard fighters, and you, you look at the records, you go take your take your take your take your, yeah, yeah. and then they produce a boring fight, and mm -hmm. then some of that you think is going to produce a boring fight, doesn't, but hopefully they won't. Um, if I can pronounce his name correct, Halan San, I'm gonna go for for now. Um, I know Chris. I know Chris said about him being a fringe fighter and everything. I think maybe one more step up first. Mm. I think the next level before he starts uh, well, get picked out. Well, people all thought Khalil Vanchi was gonna be a fringe fighter and then he knocks out Saki. Yeah, it's a, you don't know. We don't know what the thing is yet, do we? We don't know I'm, until I'm gonna go for Price. Yeah, I'm going for Price as yeah. well. Yeah. I, I'm going to say it's by decision though. I think for exactly yeah. the reason you have, I think both guys are tough and I don't think they're going to be able to get one another out. Well, I was going to yeah. go for a TKO in some round. Maybe second round. I think he's going to frustrate Alisson. Yeah. I think he's going to frustrate him. Mm -hmm. So we'll move on to our second fight of the card and it's the first of two female fights on there take place in the strawweight division. Strawweight's been amazing over these last couple of years in my opinion. Definitely one of the most underrated divisions in the UFC in my opinion. And we've got a really compelling matchup. Uh, Jessica Andrade going up against Karolina Kovalkiewicz. Again, I apologise if I got that one wrong. A lot of the reports on the internet was the original plan was for Rose and Yunus to fight Andrade, possibly in Madison Square Garden. Rose, though, is nursing a neck injury, so we hope she gets better soon. Mm -hmm. But that fight fell through, and Andrade is desperate to get back, um, back into action. So this fight was created between her and Karolina. Now... I'd probably go as far, to be honest, and say if I had to choose my favourite female fighter in the UFC right now, it would be Andrade. Right. She is so gung-ho, so aggressive, and her fight's nearly always entertaining. Yeah, uh, that's, that's like, whether you know anything about MMA or you don't, entertainment's probably the... That's what oh, it is, yeah, isn't yeah. it? The UFC is that, you can see what you want, it's an entertainment, really, you know what I mean? I know there's so much discipline towards it and everything else, and this has come from, like, come from me as a, as a fighter. It is all about entertainment. Oh, yeah, yeah. You don't want to watch, no matter how good, you don't want really, not many people watch a game of chess today. No. You want something a lot more explosive, and yeah, that's probably what she brings to it. And I think there's another thing that she brings as well. For a female, she is so strong. Yeah. I have never seen anybody just chuck around women in the way she has. I mean, <coughs> the fight with Claudia Gadelia, I mean, I've had a lot of people on my videos, especially the 10 greatest women's MMA fights. And they were all saying that has to be up there as number one. Just the way she was chucking around mm -hmm. a top level opponent like Claudia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic. So I mean she can she's quite powerful as well, she's a good puncher, but it's her grappling, which is a real advantage. Yeah, yeah. And going back to the strength then, there's no reason why a woman I know they're not meant to be the they are meant to be the weaker by thing, but uh, pound for pound women and uh, pound for pound the same weight a woman and a man, there's no reason why a woman can't be stronger, is there? Yeah. So just or just as strong. Then like if that other if the other women haven't got that man strength if you like she she's really gonna all be overpowering isn't she? Well, I tell you what people are going on about super fights now and what we should be doing we should be doing cyborg versus Henry Cejudo. Yeah. Ah, I'd love to see. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know. I know. Uh, has cyborg got an opponent yet? Ah, <laughs> uh, she'll be fighting Nunes on the New Year's Eve card. Is that the New Year's right? Right. Oh well. There we go. And I mean I'm not the biggest lover of super fights. I think there's. There's an appeal to that one though. Right. Um, obviously, when we get around to the Sometimes center, you yeah. have to do the super fights for certain reasons, so yeah. Well, not just <laughs> I think that. usually, if he, even if the the pool talent in that in the particular category isn't that good, and they then they, yes, they, they need, need testing, but agreed. So you need to cross. Sometimes they need to do that. Like, if there's no one kicking about and they're ready to fight, sometimes they need to just do that. Have maybe six like couple months training fight. Have another so it gives them maybe like maybe maybe nine months off, and in that nine month hope that there's someone in the division mm -hmm. that comes a rising yeah, talent. Yeah. Sometimes the beat, and you know you, we've had these re how many rematches and stuff like that, and and it what's the point? Of it, what's the point yeah. of a trilogy if you won the first two? Agreed. You know, so I think they do need that super fight, or like I say, move up or down the, that weight, like you say, and they might be comfortable with that, but so they might just need another one fight, come back down, and hopefully. Fingers crossed, someone's gone on a massive winning streak. And I think it's coming at a time as well where women's bantamweight is dead right now. There yeah. are no contenders merging. Cyborg is in a two-person division, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I don't understand that. Moving back to this fight, though, obviously we talked about Andrade and her massive strength. 
But she's going up against quite a tricky opponent in Kavalina Kovalkiewicz because it's quite interesting to talk about Kavalina because it's, it's almost a given that we have to see her as one of these sort of top-level strawweights. But if you look at her record apart from the Rose fight, I mean, Felice Herrick's the second biggest win. And then you look at people like Jordi Esquivel, Heather Clark. I think she needs another top-level win to properly solidify herself yeah. as an elite strawweight. At yeah. the moment, she's sort of like 1B. Yeah. When she needs to be one here. Yeah. yeah. It all depends on who she gets put in, put, get put in front of her as well. But all she can do is just win whoever they put in front of her, which obviously that's what that's the main that's her objective, I suppose, of, of the fight. Do you have an opinion on Carolina, Chris? I think she's a technical striker. Um, she's patient. Yeah. She's very patient. So that what that's what makes her a good counter striker. And um, she's. I think that's that's her. Her forte, really. I think um, if she's patient with Jessica, Jessica, she'll uh, and just keeps the movement going. Pretty much using the Joanna fight as a blueprint. Yes, she can beat her. And I think sometimes Carolina somewhat unfairly gets treated as sort of like a Joanna light. I think when you compare the two, I think Carolina, as you mentioned before, she's a bit more patient. And I think as well she's a bit more technical. Yuana is just primarily Muay Thai striking base. But I've seen Carolina do in Manavi roles. She seems comfortable enough when she's in top position. My one worry when it comes to Andrade is what happened when she fought Claudia Gadelia. When uh, Claudia took her down, um, Carolina pretty much immediately gave up her back and got choked out in the first round. And I think the stock took a big hit after that fight. Mm -hmm. And she's just starting to build up that momentum again. I mean... If she does get through this fight, if she beats Andrade, who is basically like a tank, then she'll deserve to have that rematch against Rose. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. That's what that's her probably that's her objective, isn't it? Yes. So you know, um, so yeah, it's it's to honest, it's an open air fight. That I would say. I have to go with that. I think the big thing though is Carolina needs to be more aggressive. Yeah. If she takes the time around Andrade and Andrade cuts the cage a bit better, which she has been doing in the most recent fights, then it's going to be takedown city. But if she can follow what Ioana did, tire Andrade out, take her into the deep waters, I don't think Andrade's cardio is that great. She'll learn from that, I think. Yeah. I think, I think you know, like these, we've said this about time and time again, at any level, at, 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 from, from lower down to our level, to Barry Chris's level, to, to UFC level, it all depends as well on the surrounded by, isn't it? Yes. When they get beat off that loss, they don't, you don't necessarily know yourself you need you, you need a great corner and great coach great team around you to say look at this is where we went wrong in in try and work on this the weaknesses rather than your strengths that you're already good at you know so i think they'll go back to the drawing board after that and moving a bit forward how do you think each of these opponents would do when the rose fight eventually happens like andrade versus rose and then carolina versus rose the rematch i'd probably go for rose really in both scenarios possibly I yeah. think I'd agree with that. I think Rose has improved a lot. Yeah, what about yourself? In, in the time since. I would say, I think she would beat Carolina. You, you're, you're like Jessica. I am, I'm a big <laughs> Andrade fan, so I yeah. am a little bit biased. Uh, be honest, I thought Andrade was going to be the one to beat Iwata, so right. that just shows how much I know. Yeah, no. In, all these fights, you know, the, you can have underdogs and favourites. It is sometimes hard to turn up on the night, and uh, we don't know. To look at the day sometimes. It is. Yes. We it still is. don't know what they do behind closed doors. You know, unless you train mm. with that person, you, you don't, don't know. know how they change their game. They might completely mix things up. You know, you do. You want to Chris is unbeaten. You want to be unbeaten. Don't get me wrong. You definitely want to be unbeaten. But when you get beat, you learn. how much things might you just say right that last fight camp we scrap at that we're going back to basics or we're going a complete different thing or the draft a new coaching or anything. You know. And well, we, we've seen that with Rose. Yeah. Every fight that Rose has lost, she's learned from. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the Tisha Torres fight when she had an addict there, she realised, I just can't be this wild brawler. Uh, the Esparza fight realised, I need to work on my ground game. And then the Carolina fight, I need to work on my clinch. Yeah. So she's always developed and evolved after every loss. That's good, it's good on her. Definitely. It's very good on Because, you know, you don't like the change of winning formula when you're winning. Um, so if you win, you'd, even if you know that... Look, I still need to work on this. You think that you don't want to change things because you're winning, you win. You know what I mean? But obviously, not realizing that sometimes your opponents are getting stronger and stronger. But but when you get beat, I know it's a sad way to do it. But when you get beat, probably the best time to learn because you really sinks in that you're not as good as you thought in that area, or someone's given you a skill in a certain area, so you improve on that. 
Now, one person who hasn't tasted defeat all that much, I think he's something like 10 and 1 in, in uh, MMA at the moment, is the uh, key factor in our next fight. And again, a surname which I'm dreading saying this, it is Zabid Magomed Sharipov, uh, yeah. who is currently the number 15 featherweight in the world. Now, we were just talking about this before the yeah. show actually started. This guy has the potential to be a champion. I, I really love good. watching yeah. him fight. Yeah, he's really good. He is very good. Um, I think Brendan did for a hard night, a real hard night. Um, yes, I think that was that was that, was that, was that <laughs> Is that correct? Uh, Zabit, yeah. We'll Zabit, just call him Zabit. Zabit, Zabit, Zab, Zabai, Zad. Just said. Um, no, he's really good. I think he has got huge potential. Would you agree, or do you think oh, he's going to be? I think he's got massive potential. He reminds me a little bit of in his grappling sense of Khabib, um, just yeah. with a bit more, of a, but he's a more polished striker. Um, so, like, especially with his. Like judo trips and yeah. stuff like that, his pickups. Uh, I think he's a more polished. Yeah. I don't want to say a more polished Khabib, because Khabib's outstanding in yeah. what he does. But it, all round, I think he's a better striker. Yeah. And he's got that style yeah. of Khabib yeah. on the ground. How old is he? Just for our curiosity. Or... Um, I'm still to think of it off the top of my head, actually. No. I think he's not in his 30s yet. No, no, so he's still, mm. still got... Not, well, you can talk no, anyway, it's kind of, but yeah. I thought that... Um, no, he's... I, I don't know how to say this, but really, I think he probably could have done with a bigger opponent than Brandon. Yes. Um, I think now, due to rank 15, if I'm looking there, I think now he probably wants to start breaking in the top 10. Well, the original plan for this fight was for it to be himself versus Yair Rodriguez. Right. Yair had to pull off a injury. Some speculation on the internet that Yayi had never intended to take the fight. It was just a means of trying to get back into the UFC after him and Dana White fell out. Right. A um, couple of replacements were put forward. John Lineker said he'd be up for it. Which, when you look at the size difference between the two, it just would have been comedic. Um, Jeremy Stevens was rumoured as an opponent. The guy I wanted to see, which I think would have been a great fight, Shane Burgos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, look, he wanted to take it off for Brandon, you know what I mean? He's took the fight, whether yeah. he's being forced in or whether he's put his hand up and shout, shout for it, I don't know. But, I mean, in all fairness to Brandon, this is another thing I've just been saying, you don't know what people do behind closed doors. Um, Brandon might feel like he needs his fight to get the win, to push him right back up there, um, or push him up there, you know what I mean? Rather than just beat anybody or anyone lower down, I suppose. This is his way of getting... a massive boost for him if he does it. Oh, it's win. huge. Massive I mean, even if he went, even if he put up a... I mean, you don't want to do this, but even if he put up a great fight and got beat on his decision, you know, I mean, it would surely give him another fight in the UFC, definitely. Um, but no, for Z, 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 I think... I'm trying to know if he's had to pull out. Um, I think he's not going to go any higher than 15th after this, if he no. wants to win. I think next time he's got to be looking at someone in the top 10. Got well, to be. The story I've heard with, that Zabit wants is Zabit wants to actually fight Yaya before the end of the year. Right. And then I think they would maybe look... I think, again, I think that Jeremy Stevens fight would be a good opportunity because Stevens coming off a loss, sort of around that sort of top six, top seven-ish. And I think that would be a... Definitely. I mean, that's the type of fight that lad needs. One win puts him to the seventh. Or at least in the top ten. I think they put that much effort into it. Unless they're coming off a loss. They put that much effort into a training fight, you know, and all this, and, and you, you are only going to shock career, you know what I mean? You, you need to be making the f weight of fights that are important. Yeah. Just, if he ever thinks about getting a title content, a title fight, and he's coming into his prime zone, he then needs to be within that title shot range in the next couple of years, really. I am really looking forward to this fight, though. I mean, I mean Zabit has impressed me so much since he came into the UFC, but when you looked at that fight against Kyle Bokniak, which just absolutely stole the show mm -hmm. at UFC 223, if he puts in that sort of performance as well against Brandon Davis, and I think Davis is going to be up for this. Yeah, definitely. He realises he's got nothing to lose, so yeah. I think we've got potential here for another entertaining fight. fight. Yes, definitely. I agree. I think uh, I think you, you, you're more cautious when you've got stuff to lose. You've got something yeah. to lose. He, like you said, he's coming in there with everything to gain and maybe not, a lot, not, not very much to lose, apart from a loss on his record, which, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think Brandon will come in with all the ones blazing and, and, and really up for it. And I think it's quite appropriate as well, if you look at Brandon Davis's UFC record, it's one win and two losses. One of those losses against Kyle Bokniak. Right. So it's, it's, uh, it's strange how to sort of like circle goes around. Goes around the circle, oh, I, Yeah. Um, I, yeah, it's a, like I say, I don't know how this has come about, this fight, where, like I say, because it's, 
it's probably that wasn't the ideal fight from really and it's like I say if he wins then it'll be the best fight he's ever done yeah. but really on paper at the minute it's probably not his ideal opponent win it with a record of one win two losses but we'll see what happens won't we on the day see how he comes up, up, up are we up. going for Zabit in this one I think yeah so, mate yes I have to agree there will it be in one round two round or will it go the distance I don't think it'll go the distance um, I'm going go round two yeah, I'll go. Um, I'm not sure what round. I'm, I'm just going to sit on the fence for that. Um, because uh, that will also depend on how Brandon comes out and how they both come out. Like I said, sometimes they can make a producing or slow fight. Tough, or a thing, but well. um, I, I don't think it'll go there. I can't take one distance. If there's one worry I have in regards to Zabit, though, is he sometimes his ego can get a bit carried away with him. Um, and we saw with, with the Bokniak fight as well. Bokniak tried to lure him into making it a brawl, and Zabit said, all right then. And that that's 10 seconds, where it was just full on just wild swinging. You can't afford to have that sort of... Mentality. No. No, I agree. I agree. He's caught him in my roasting for that. He's caught him boxing. I've been roasted. Yeah. Yeah. Ford, you can be roasted, and you can go, you can hold your hands up and afterwards in the change room, it, come up to this next fight and go, leave, you'll get your hands up, never do that again. But if he gets put back in that situation again, his brains are the winner and the adrenaline's rushing, there's no reason why things can't happen like that again. If if that's if, if that's the mentality of him in person, you know, you can't you can't sort of take it away from someone, can you? Totally agree. We'll move on to our our core main event, and it's the first of two fi- title fights which is taking place. And it for the first time we will see the women's flyweight title being defended. And it is the champion Nico Montagno who is defending against Valentina Shevchenko. And we'll start with first and foremost with Nico because I don't think I've ever seen a situation like this before in regards to the UFC where we have this new division, we have a champion, and yet it feels like nobody knows who she is. Uh, well, I think that's probably why she didn't call the main event. I think for whatever reason, well, the reason was be that I, I didn't really know, but. The UFC, for these last however couple of years, or maybe this last year or more, are really pushing women, women fighting. Um, I don't know whether it's about equal rights or whether there's someone in there who just loves the women thing, but they seem to be pushing it. And instead of just put, having, the, having the women kicking about and putting them on the undercard and brushing them on the carpet, it's like they're really, really pushing them, like I say, come in an event. Um, and the, the UFC rooster at the minute is absolutely stacked, rammed, rammed. Um, you know what I mean? That's why people are getting lost off because there's that many. And they they really put the women to the front, I think. I think another factor as well, which sort of like didn't do Nico any favours, was her title win came on the Ultimate Fighter, which has sort of been lagging a bit yeah. recently. I think what would have maybe helped the division a bit more is they have like an eight-person tournament, have a couple of like strawweights moving up, a couple of bantamweights moving down, a couple of the top girls have been victor. And I think you would have had a good tournament. It would have got people to really get behind the idea of who the yeah. champion is. The other fighter seems to have fallen down in the recent years, haven't they? It has, yeah. I mean, I think there's just a new one started this last well, last week, and I don't, I haven't took no... Um, it's a shame, really, I mean, you know, we all live busy lives, and oh, you can only watch and do it so much, but, uh, yeah, yeah, probably the other fighter could do it, probably two years off. Yes. And just two years off. Charge people's batteries that. towards Don't them. do it. Just completely knock it off the head, and then they'll make it come back in two years, but people go, oh, what's the other fighter now? I think it's just one after another, one after another, definitely. And they have tried in different ways, you know, when they did like, I mean, I always like the Smashers, I thought that was a brilliant name, <laughs> yeah, that when yeah. they did Australia vs UK, and then they tried like just Brazil, and they have, they, you, you can't fault the UFC, you know, what was behind all that, um, making just, obviously someone probably job just to look after the open fight and everything else, and, but I do, do think it needs to go off, to come back, go off the, the thing, and come back refreshed. I think as well, I think choosing Night Contender has become a better source of new talent compared to what the Ultimate Fighter is. Yes, who's, in, who's on the main card, who's in that, who fought on that, there was someone I, I noticed who was on the, um, the chosen Night Contender, Dana White's chosen Night Contenders. Ah, oh, I think that would have been, I'm tempted to say Jeff Neal. Possibly, possibly. Um, aye, so there we go. The, the, the good con- Contender shows are good, you know what I mean, I suppose. Um, it's sometimes the way of it's like X Factor for singing, you know what I mean? If without them, these some of these people go unrecognised, so the contender shows are a good way of putting it out there and, and they're fighting to get in there, you know what I mean? They're not getting in because of who they're training with or who they've, who they 
but they're generally on merit, aren't they? They get yeah, they, they, they are earning, they're yes. earning the stripes to be in the UFC. Going back though to Nico Montano went to her season of uh, the Ultimate Fighter Tough 26. This was a girl who, when she entered the tournament, I think she only had like a three and two record. She entered as the 14th seed, so nobody gave her any chance of winning it. And then, on her way to winning, she knocks out three. She knocks out the top three seeds. Beats Roxanne Murdaferry in the tough finale. So she's always been this underdog fighter. What, what's the key trait about Nico which stand out for you? Well, I don't, I don't know as much as that, but the, the, the thing that gets me, what you've said there, is she going in there three, three wins, two losses. Someone has seen her mm -hmm. or something for her to be, for her to probably get in the short yeah. three wins, two losses. Because yeah. really, the open fighter from years ago, you don't get in with records like that. You have to get 10 and all records oh. to get in there. So yeah. someone's obviously told her that. As a major prospect, haven't they, to, uh, to even get in there? And then, like I said, to knock out all the favourites you know, on the way to the start, and really, then I don't know what her background was back then um, to get to get in there. I mean, she hasn't got no martial art. I think she's a BJJ. BJJ, was she in all Was she? If that will play Melody. But I will fight her. Com competitor. I think that. Competitor. Not 100%, but she yeah. competitor in right. BJJ. Obviously, probably uh, probably two losses at the beginning of the career were probably really high caliber fighters. It wouldn't surprise me, and the G's probably not been ready for them. I think the thing which I've noticed from Nico from watching uh, Tough Twenty Six and watching all the videos on Fight Pass is I don't think she has any real weakness. I mean, she does everything solid. I mean, she's a decent striker. She's a decent wrestler. Obviously, her jiu-jitsu is a main part here, so I think that's probably where her biggest advantage is. But I think in that regard, obviously, if she's got equal level strength. She's also got equal level weaknesses. So sort of losing me train of thought here. It's gonna be hard there's nothing that I think Valentina can explicitly exploit. No. To actually get this win. Yeah. Going to Valentina though, we've all seen what she's done so far in the UFC. Obviously she fought a bank away for a long time, got to being the number one contender, and you look at some of the people she's beaten as well, Sarah Kaufman, Holly Holm, Juliana Pena, doing this Fighting at a weight class, which wasn't her proper class. Quite well, impressive. Very impressive. I mean, if you look especially at the Holly fight, Holly is a big bantamweight. Yeah. And Valentina just made her look silly in stand-up. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. She's well-class herself. Holly yeah. Holm. Yeah. The Ram. No, she did well. I mean, she must have suited that as well, you know what I mean? But when you look at it like that, and like I say, it's not a comfortable weight, really, if you like. Um, She's, she's done very well. I mean, she's something to be proud of, isn't it? And did you say she got number one? Number, number one bantamweight, even one. though she was basically a flyweight. She didn't cut any weight. Yeah. Very good, like. Very good. That's impressive alone, like I said. And uh, to also three Muay Thai victories over Joanna as well. So she's got that on her uh, repertoire as well. Yeah. In terms of her flyweight, though, she's only had the one fight so far. And an absolutely dominating performance against Priscilla Cauchuera. Although, considering Priscilla, Priscilla's lack of skill, lack of experience, can you really say Valentina's going to do this sort of top level flyweight? I mean, this was a, a weaker opponent. This was basically a squash match for Valentina. I don't know why she got that then, really. Um, because Especially when she's been so high in the yeah, yeah, because division. If she'd been so high in a lightweight division, I can understand coming up a weight. And getting a, a yeah. more of a, a, a easy point. But coming down a weight, you generally fight like if you were ranked that top end. Yeah, if you yeah. were ranked 20th yeah. even, if you come down, you probably then fight that ranked number 10. Because you feel like you're coming down until you're stronger, a more dominant opponent. But for her, like I say, I, I think uh, that's maybe all the UFC had to offer her at, the, at that date, at that time, at that scenario. And or Priscilla was the only person willing to fight her. Possibly, that, you know, that's another thing, isn't it? You know, all these people, I don't know what the UFC contract state and how they do it, but when they do it, why comes asking, to, can they decline? Obviously, they must be able to say, or they just make an excuse and say, oh, I'm injured, or that date doesn't suit me. And like you say, if she was the only person with a hand up, and she's willing to fight and want to fight at that time for whatever reason, then things have to happen, you know, and you can only fight who's in front of you. I think one thing we did see from Valentina in that fight, though, maybe yeah, Priscilla wasn't an opponent to test her all round skills. But compared to how she fought at bantamweight, Valentina was primarily stand-up based when she was bantamweight. A bit too scared to get involved in the clinch battles, obviously being a smaller girl. But at flyweight, obviously she fight people the same size. She was much better in the clinch, she was 
hammering those stair elbows in that Priscilla fight. It almost Habib-like, mm -hmm. just in how devastating they were. I think she'll bring it to uh, Ico as well, like, I think she really yeah. will. I find she uh, Valentina for the fight. Yeah, yeah. I do as well. Yeah, I think she'll take it to her. Um, and I mean, she's not necessarily weight cutting, is she? Really, she sort of well, she will be maybe a little bit, but obviously it's not affecting. I think I think she'll be a real strong opponent at that weight. I think so as well. Um, I actually did re look at the uh, bookmakers odds before this fight. Right. And you could get Nico. Bear in mind, she's a champion. You could get Nico to win this fight at about eight to one, eight to one, nine to one. See, so, I never. But generally, unless it's like something like that, I generally always stick to the champion until the champion gets big. Yeah. But I might, I might go against me willing and go for the like contender. Really, I believe the biggest long shot champion going into a fight was Matt Serra against GSP at UFC 83. Right. And I think that was something like five to one. So you could see the odds are against Nico for this one, but the odds were against her in uh, Tough 26. Yeah. So. That's, well, that's it. You know she's used to that, isn't she? So, and it's quite it's quite sad actually for a champion to be still the underdog. Yes. Yeah, but I think if she wins the fight, it's better for her. Definitely, I always think if you that will cement her place. Yeah, I think. Yes, definitely. I think a win like that will definitely cement her place. And I think that will then stop her being underdog. Yeah. Against people, I think people might just start thinking. But as as I stand at the minute, I think she's the underdog. Would it be the biggest upset of the year if Nico pulls this off? I think. I think that's yeah, a massive upset. I think what Mighty Mouse Cejudo is probably number one at the moment. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I I wouldn't say it's going to be the biggest no, but I would definitely say it's up there instead. Definitely for the female. Oh, definitely. Um, what do you think, uh, Nico's? What's her route to victory? What do you think she needs to exploit from Valentina? Um, well, like you say, if the, you know. No matter what, you, when you're in deep waters, you, you always go back to your probably your um, your roots, don't you? Roots. And then obviously BJJ is her roots. Then uh, no matter how good Shevchenko is, I would think she's gonna try and exploit her in that way of some form. I think you always do it if you're on the back, especially if you get on the back foot. You go with your what feels most natural, where you don't have to think, where you just it, that's in her blood, isn't it? Really. So I would go for that. Not that Shevchenko is weak at that or anything like that. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying obviously. That's it. she's going for her strength, man. She's she's going for she will be focusing on her strength more than her weakness. Yeah. I think she just needs to take um, Valentina down. Basically, lie on top of her, mm. chip away, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Unless unless the submissions there, obviously. Yeah. But uh, we did see Shevchenko submit Pena um, yeah. back in what January twenty seventeen. So, yeah, I mean, you know, Shevchenko might it might be a shock where it, Shashenko looks the piece to be winning on the floor and everything mm -hmm. else, and she can just make or pull something out of the rear. I think that's the only way I see. But pulling something out of the bag. That's the only way I see her winning. Shashenko getting carried away mm -hmm. in some type of in some form on the floor, and maybe getting fallen into a trap. So are we all going for Valentina to win this one? I think I am. Yeah, I am. Same. So we move on to our main event then. It's our welterweight title fight, and it is Britain's Darren Till going up against Tyron Woodley. And we need to start with the story about Darren Till. Uh, 12 months ago, the guy was unranked. He'd only had, I think, three fights in the UFC, just preparing to fight Don Cerrone in the main event of Gdansk. And then, 12 months later, he's on the verge of fighting for a title. And a lot of people saying he has a good shot of winning it. The rise to stardom is fantastic for him. Um, really has come out of nowhere. Um, I mean, I've been around him for, for all my life, and so has Chris. I, I, before he was in the UFC, I, I didn't. I'd never heard of him. No, I had not. Honestly, I, I really. I never. I mean, that's got something to do with him never fighting in the UK. Obviously, he, he lived in Brazil for a long time. Yeah, I mean, that's got something. I mean, I probably know more anything more than more than anything of the UK MMA circuit. You know what I mean? Because it was the lads from my gym, myself fighting them. So you go on the shows yeah, yeah. to watch them. So I know more about. So that was the main probably thing for me because obviously I've never seen him fight locally. Um, but like I say, his, his rise to stardom has been, when he first got the UFC, he would never have expected this. No. So soon at least. Even if he thought in his head he would be a champion or fight for the title, he would never have thought in what, how long has he been in the UFC? Two and a bit year? Two and a bit year, yeah. He'd never have thought in two and a half years he'd still probably be unbeaten fighting for a world title. There is a bit of fortune in regards to how he's got this title shot though. Yes. The original story was, the plan was time worthy <coughs> to fight Colby Covington, who was UFC interim champion for some You reason. can't make being brilliant, but 
In December, I'm sure I'm seeing it looks a fall away. Yeah, definitely. Look at this thing. Yeah, I know. Oh, this thing won the title. I know, I know. Definitely. That, that's still one of my favourite MMA moments ever. That. Yeah. He probably, you know, I, I'm pleased he did that. You know, I really am because I think he has he got the most ever fights in the UFC. Oh, yeah, he did have the most wins. wins most he wins. had the most, most wins. Most wins. I knew there was something. I think it, um, I think Jeremy Stevens might have the most fights. You know, he went in the UFC. I think in the over fight at ten and all. Like and he and he, then that's it. The rest of his career was all UFC. He won the Ultimate Fighter. He won the, the so. He'd he been a bit of a the life of a first. He'd been a bit of a you beat Bisping, you fight for the title. Same with middleweight. So that just finished his career off yes. winning that title. So I was over the moon for that really mm-hmm. actually. And also, in a hundred years time, no matter how many champions Great Britain get, he was still He'll the be first. Number he was still the first yeah. ever British champion, and that's massive. That that is massive. I think. What's been interesting to see in regards to Till and his perception is. As, as good as Michael Bisping was for British MMA, he was still, in regards to the mainstream media, a bit of a niche figure. Yeah. Um, but when you look at it at Till, I mean, you go on the BBC website, they're starting to get very heavy on MMA, and it's all Till. Yeah. I don't think, I don't know how to put this, but I don't think Till's classed as much as a Brit as Michael Bisping. I know that sounds <laughs> weird. <laughs> so I don't class him as a Brit as much as a British thing. I don't. I think it's because because he's never fought in the UFC. Yeah, until and he's, he's not really up. been on the UFC. UK UK scene. Scene. It's so. it like, and he's. I think has he lived more of his life abroad? I think so. Yes. You know what I mean? Obviously, he is. Didn't he? Live, I think he lived in Brazil about eight years or something like so that. So he is. He's actually got a but he is. over there. Obviously, when he, if he wins the title, I think. Uh, Obviously, the Great Britain, Great British public's going to jump on the bandwagon. Yes. And then Brits won the title, Britain, which is fair enough. He is British. He is British. Don't get us wrong. But um, I probably won't see him as real at first until probably if he wins the title and he starts defending his title in England and becoming an English national, national hero, really. So if we start talking about sort of Till's roots, roots to try and win this fight, I think the big thing we need to look at is the size difference between the two. I mean, Till cuts a lot of weight to get down to yeah. 178. We saw that stare down between himself and Woodley, and the size difference between the two, absolutely massive. Yeah, um, if he makes weight. If he makes weight, which is another point I was going to I'm, make there. I'm really on the fence because, for myself, I'm actually fighting my next fight at the weight I walk around at, which, I mean, Chris, we have to, we sometimes, we, you can look at it both ways because you think, uh, am I doing the right thing by not cutting weight? I'm not being lazy, but am I... Because, Cause like what you said, I'll be fighting someone on that day a lot heavier than me. But at the same time, I'm not draining myself, yeah. cutting the weight. So it's really, it's it's, it's yeah. like that. It all depends on how you cut the weight and the, and how your body copes and reacts to cutting the weight. I think because some people I've seen fight and they're brilliant fighters, and they are terrible in that cage to what they've been in the gym yes. and training because they they they've depleted the their body for, and and it, they weigh in twenty four hours. Well, that that body, some bodies can. Make a full recovery in twenty four hours. Some can't. Well, obviously well, Darren Till will have the best of um, nutritionists and best mm-hmm. of people around him. But if your body can't do, you know what I mean. And I think that also tells in later rounds. What's gonna What's gonna happen to Till though if he was to miss weight? I mean, there's a big lot of worries around him. But well, it can't be a title fight. I think he needs to move to middleweight if, if that happens. Yeah. Yes, and if that yeah. happens definitely because then that's the second time that it's happened. And especially Dana White's quite thing like that as well, man. I think that will yes. be. Um, oh. it, you're basically you're not fighting a world weight anymore. I think that because it, well, it's, it's a mockery. Ball. It's a mockery, especially when it's yeah. a title it, fight as well. It, it, yeah, it's definitely. I mean, we you class. I mean, we find a lot smaller shows, and we class ourselves as professional. Yeah. And it's very unprofessional to come in the weight. Okay. In the UFC, to do it once is unprofessional. To do it twice, I think, and I, I honestly do believe that Dana White would say, you either fight a middleweight or you don't fight at all." I think he will move to middleweight at some point in the future. He probably want to win the title. It yeah. probably wouldn't surprise me by saying that though. If you win the title, you want to you want to become a proper champion and defend it, don't you? But um, unless you Connor. <laughs> well, of course, I Connor doesn't like doing it. He got away with it, didn't he? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, where do you go if you get beat? Because you think you know, okay, let's go to middleweight. But then do you think, well, if I'm getting beat off a welterweight. Am I going to get beat? Am I going to get? But are you getting beat off a welter? Really? Because, because you're not you're defined, defined, you Yes, that's it. This is this. We don't know how how Darren Till's body is really what it's going through. It might surprise Ronnie. Might have done something. That might be a kick up the ass, and he might have really focused on his weight 
since his last fight. Well, from the pictures I've seen, he does look a lot leaner yeah. than he did. I don't think he'll make the same mistake again. For one, for one thing, because whether that fight goes ahead or not, if he misses weight, that ti- that's not title. That's, he can win the fight, but it's not a title fight. Can't be. If he misses weight, he cannot be fighting for the title. But one of the stories that had been going round was that if Till was a miss weight, they would have Kamara Usman uh, preparing himself for the fight. Out. And put Usman in. Uh, Woodley doesn't seem too happy about that I idea. I wouldn't be happy about that. No. I'd rather fight Darren Till and say, look, the fight's the title's off. Because <laughs> it's that weight for the 70 kilo title, whatever, in pounds. Um, but I would definitely, definitely still prefer to fight Darren Till, even if he was 3 kilo. Yeah. I really would. I really would, honestly. Not the day before getting a different opponent. I'd rather stick to the last the ladder, you know. Unfortunately, this does mean we have to start talking about Tyron Woodley. Arguably one of the most unpopular champions in the UFC. But somebody who I sort of feel maybe gets a bit of a bad rap for how he performed as champion. Because, again, I know there's a lot of Woodley detractors out there and I apologise to anybody who thinks who would probably be turning this off by now. Woodley's a very smart fighter. Yeah. He, he'll do, he does what needs to be done to win. That's, so, that's all. That, that, look at JSP. Yeah. yeah. I think JSP, in late, later on in his career, he started... Trying to know. Not necessarily. I think he he started having given more entertainment, so he was standing up with people more. Because yeah. everybody was used to seeing JSP just t- just blast people, yeah. take them down, and get that win. Yeah. But he was becoming boring. Yeah. Or people thought it was boring. Yeah. So later on, he started standing up a bit more. And I think I don't. I wouldn't like to see Woodley follow that same thing. No, not if you not if you get beat. Not if you don't. Not if, I don't know if it's going to affect your chances of winning. At the end of the day, if that was me, and I've got that world title, I don't care your opinion of what other people are saying. Yeah. I want to mm-hmm. keep that title. If that title meant me keeping to what I know best, you don't change the winning formula. No, no. And I think, God, we've seen this in these last three title offences, against Wonderboy, you know Wonderboy's going to be a great counter striker. So you've got to try and make him lead the fight. Mm-hmm. And, if Wonder, and if Wonderboy wants to be patient to play his own game, then obviously you're going to get a dull fight. With Damian Maia, you know how good he is at takedowns. Yeah. So you're going to do what you can to try and avoid that. Yeah. I mean, he's got... Like I say, I can't understand anyone who criticises him for, for doing what he does to win. He, at the end of the day, he, he's, got the, he's got the title. And he's won the defender. He, he, you know, I, like, I know what people are saying. I do sort of understand a little bit. But for, if I was Tyron Woodley and I was his corner man and anything else, it's basically, we're getting the win. You were getting the win... Whatever the audience is saying about us, whether you're not a fan favorite, who cares really? And really, bad publicity is better than no publicity. Yeah. 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 In terms of how Woodley's gonna try and win this fight, you've got to have to look at his knockout power. Yes, definitely. I mean, what he did to Robbie Lawler, who's yeah. been such a long-standing, Great. beloved Great fight, champion, yeah. and he just cleaned him out in the first round. He's yeah. always got that power. He dropped uh, Thompson twice in yeah. his two He's fights. A powerful man. He's Very a powerful, powerful man. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Ah, honestly, I think he's a re- he's a power. Re- wrestlers generally are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, he's. I mean, he is. He's a power. He's a power. You wouldn't fancy a hook off him, would you? And I think that's maybe why he fights so conservatively as well to keep that power. Probably, probably. I mean, if he come out a hundred miles an hour like some of the lightweight, like well, I know he's only well, like like the lower, even lower weights. Mm-hmm. I think he probably would probably gas out, and you don't want that. You want to be in control of the fight at all times. You go. You, he wants to go at his own pace. He wants to set his pace. The big question is. Does he have the power to knock out a bigger man like Till? Yeah, um, I think he can knock just about anybody out yeah, with vision. Um, I think it'll be harder because I think Till's a, I think he's a better striker than Wonderboy. I th- yeah, I, they, I'm not too square with that. I just think and he's a southpaw. Yeah. I just think if he catches him, still, uh, but size doesn't necessarily matter. I mean, obviously, the, if he was a major different weight, but you're talking about someone who's theoretically meant to be weighing in at the same weight. 24 hours beforehand, mm-hmm. and I definitely, definitely think he could knock him out. Well, I've seen Melvin Manhoff knock out uh, Mark Hunt, though, so... Yeah, that's it. Goes, it goes back to that depletion. Yeah. If you haven't this been way, rehydrated this, properly... This is where Darren Till could fail yeah, big time. Yeah. If you haven't yes. rehydrated properly, you have fluid around your brain, you, you'll get hit. You, and there's not as much fluid around you your brain you as take, you take a bottle of water out, like a bottle of pop there, and you'll pour it out. And you put it back up, it obviously goes from the top, it's like, mm-hmm. you, it's like your body. When you're dehydrated, you're losing all this water, it starts from the top, it doesn't lose water from your feet, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And this, your brain is absolutely surrounded by all this fluid. And definitely, I've 
pull up before and, and done it before where I've been that dehydrated, you're jumping on the canvas and you can feel yeah. your brain rattling about, let alone someone cracking you. So I, I definitely think if Darren Till doesn't make the weight cut correct, he could be in for a very, very poorly night. And other soft drinks are available, by the way. <laughs> in, I think it's going to be a very close fight. If you look at the bookmakers' odds, they pretty much got it dead even between the two of them. I think Woodley's just a slight favourite, but something like plus 130, 120, something like that. So bookmakers can't call it. What's your gut say? Woodley. I'm going to go for Till. Yeah. I want to think Till can keep him off him. He's big, he's strong. I think he's a better striker. And I think he could frustrate Woodley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be a fantastic story for Jared Till to win this fight, man. Oh, it would time. be absolutely. It'd be good for British MMA. I mean, I think he realistically, if he wins this fight, even if he doesn't become anything else after that, there's a movie in the making. There's a movie in the making for him in years yeah. to come because I think that is a fantastic story, better than maybe even McGregor's story, if you like, because he really was unknown, not not to himself or the people close to him, maybe, but to he wasn't really. A Champion in cage warriors or nothing, anything nothing, like that. He nothing, just, he just definitely like exactly what Chris has just said there. He's come out of nothing, and I'll tell you now, two years ago, he didn't even think he was, he didn't even in his wildest dreams, no way he was going to be in two years' time. So it would be a fantastic story for him to win, mind. You are definitely. auditioning for the lead role in the Darren Till story? Got to be, depending if he wins. <laughs> Shout accent. I don't know, I'll try. So that's our assessment of USC 228. What's your verdict? Oh, I didn't really want to say this. Go on. My gut says, I think it's a big, it's a big moment for Till. It's, it's the biggest fight of his career. I've just got this feeling he's going to get a little bit frustrated, a little bit carried away, and what he's going to catch him coming in. Yeah, that's, that's my that's my feeling. So do you think the pressure's going to? I do, yes. Yeah. Um, I do think he will make weight. I think yeah. there's a few big question marks around this fight. But I think he will make weight, but I do, I think Woody wins it. I think he'll make weight as well. Yeah, I think he's really high. They'll not make that mistake. mistake. Yeah. And like I say, it's for the title. Like he would come off and get that chance. If he, if he made weight, he went on a big Woodley. He would never. He would kick himself the rest of his life yes. to yeah. beat him without and then without winning the title. Mm -hmm. And it would confuse the division as well because yeah. you have. The, do you do the rematch? Do you yeah. do the tell yeah. What happens with Cole? So that's Covington? probably why Dana White's probably saying if he misses weight, he's not fighting him. That's probably what you because I did never thought of it like that because honestly, if I was Woodley. I would still regardless what if I tell. Yeah. But that's probably why. Because then he's going to be number one in the world. But really then he's not... he's not. He wouldn't be number one in the world the division because really he's not, he's not well weight. Ah. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It is a hard one. Like You can look at it from loads of different angles. So that's our assessment of USC 228. Um, there's a lot of big cards coming up over the last couple, next couple of months. This has sort of been lost in the shuffle. But when you actually look at the card itself, I mean, we've got a couple of ranking fights there, potential number one contender match. Two title fights. This is a pretty solid card. I think so. Yeah. Do you know what? It's not until you look into it and go into it and like talk about it as much until you realise it's actually a bigger, better card than you think. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> if you were just flicking through them, I think I had, yeah, there's a title mm -hmm. fight. But no, they're, they're really, that really is a decent, solid, quite card. And how many times have we seen over the last couple of years where we've had these really bad cards on paper which turn out brilliant? I mean, 224. First show we did, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And like you know, you can get the you can get some of the biggest names in the world and the producers. I think because the hype's bigger as well. Yeah. Sometimes the producers power. And like you said, so you can't work. It's all how we come on the night. You know, two fighters sometimes make a boring fight, even if they're brilliant. Two, two sometimes half not two average fighters can make a fantastic fight of the night. Yeah. So that's our assessment of USC 228. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, for joining us. And thank, thank you very you. much, Chris, as well. Uh, continuing the good work with uh, IFS MMA. Please also, as well, get your comments in on who you think is going to win each of our main and co-main events. Um, and then, of course, our next show will be 229. A certain Irishman is back. Wow, well, that's a good one, isn't that's it? That's the big that's one. That's where we'll need, we'll, we might need three hours for that, uh, <laughs> for that uh, coverage. But, yes. Yeah. I'm looking forward to him. I mean, I know the whole country is and everything. I, I'm, I'm pleased he's fighting because I'll be honest with you. After the Mayweather, he made 100 million supposedly. I didn't think he'd make a comeback in the MMA. I really didn't. I thought, and if I did, I thought he'd make his own show up, like you know, like how the boxers do and they promote themselves yes. to, and make it a big show in New York or whatever to make that money. I never thought he'd fight under the UFC banner again. Do you know what I mean? Um, because I just basically thought. I thought a bit of Conor as like, you know, he's, he's got them titles there and he's, 
he's made the money. I thought that's he's, he had a band. I thought you know he's going to pull up, but this is maybe the fight with him now going to say look at it. and if he wins the fight, you know he's back. But I don't know where he'll go after that. I really don't. I think Connor's sort of you've got all these fighters <laughs> like Darren Till, Tom Woodley, the third he has that. <laughs> and you can that's and, what it'll be. Do you think so? Well, there, there we go then. Because like you say, you think of all these people, you think, oh, him, him, him. With Connor, you think, well, you can fight him. And uh, after that, you know what I mean? I think sometimes he does need a year or two off for someone else to come, but Diaz 3, I never thought of that. That trilogy will always stick in the back of people's heads, won't it? Yeah. And probably Connor wants it to, to put it to bed. Put it to bed. Uh, and Diaz will definitely want it. Oh, definitely. He definitely want it. Wants the money fight. <laughs> Red panties back off. <laughs> <laughs> And on that cheery note, it is time to end the show. Thank you very much, lads, for Thank joining you very us. Much, yeah. And we hope you enjoy USC 228. Bye bye for now. Cheers, thank you. Thanks. Where it began.